There have always been forms of news. In ancient Rome, there were the Acta Diurna, which were written government bulletins, carved in stone or metal, and posted in public. In China, uh, early government news sheets called Dai Bao circulated among officials, which started in the Han Dynasty in the first and second centuries. Uh, these were arguably the world's first kind of newspaper. But for most people, uh, news was really spread through word of mouth. Remember, uh, the vast majority of people in the centuries past were illiterate and they just couldn't read. So, for example, groups of singing minstrels would travel from town to town, spreading the most recent news and gossip to locals. This would be, you know, which king was marrying their daughter off to whom, uh, who was having an affair, and other kind of scandals of the elite, along with more factual stories about military battles, alliances, famines, uh, stories about voyages and explorers, among much else. So in villages and towns of the ancient world, authorities would communicate with the public through kind of a, a town crier. These were people who would stand in the town or public square and yell out uh, public announcements to the illiterate masses. We thought we were in heaven when we left So the newspaper, at least in its contemporary European conception, was born roughly a century or so after the invention of the printing press. The very first printed newspaper is thought to have been created in the 17th century, in the year 1605, by Johann Carolus, a German language periodical titled, uh, honestly, there's really no way I can pronounce this, so I'll just put it on screen for you. So this title translates to roughly account of all distinguished and commemorable stories. So the title kind of says it all. Okay, but what exactly is a newspaper? Well, what distinguishes a newspaper from a book is primarily the nature of being a periodical. That is a printed set of news and information that comes out periodically, such as uh, every month, every week, or eventually daily. Within a few decades of Carolus's German newspaper, newspapers could be found in all major European cities. As mentioned in the lecture on the printing press, these 17th century newspapers would help spread the ideas of the Enlightenment and helped to lead to a thriving public sphere of discourse and debate, uh, which transformed Europe from a place of monarchy and feudalism into eventually constitutional republics and eventually representative governments. The names of these newspapers and the languages of their spoken readership are equally difficult for me to pronounce, but here's how they would have looked. So, not too many pictures, but some really beautiful typeface and font, uh, which at least those of you who are interested in graphic design uh, might be able to appreciate. Okay, so here's where the United States comes into the story. When the British colonized North America and established the 13 colonies, they were initially very reluctant to allow the spread of the printing press, because they knew the subversive power the press could have. Early printing presses in the British colonies were basically controlled by the British governing authorities and were used to print uh, official British government declarations and communiques. The very first colonial newspaper in the American colonies was titled Public Occurrences Both Foreign and Domestic, and it was published in Boston in 1690. However, it was shut down by the British authorities after its first issue. So you can kind of see here that the British authorities really viewed newspapers as a threat. As the colonies grew, early colonial newspapers were established, and by the mid-1700s, there were dozens of different newspapers, although many were still controlled or suppressed by the authorities. Distribution of newspapers was considered so essential that, newspaper, that published newspapers were sent through the postal system at no cost. That is, they were subsidized or paid for by the colonial government. So, so what were colonial era newspapers like? Well, they were 
pretty different from today's newspapers. To begin with, they generally had a small circulation, just a few hundred or no, no more than a few thousand readers. Uh, newspapers were relatively expensive too, so typically they were read by wealthier merchants, uh, business owners, lawyers, and other professionals of the time. These newspapers were typically weeklies, that is, published once per week, and they were only a few pages long. Amid news and events, they would feature commentaries on the pressing issues of the day. This is an issue of the Boston Evening Post, uh, dated January 9th, 1775, and what you have on page one here are essays that would have been laid out ahead of time because it's not uh, recent news, and that reflects the way these newspapers would be printed. The page one and page four would be filled up almost all the time with advertisements and essays that could be laid out ahead of time, and then that page could be hung up to dry, and then it would be flipped over, put back in the press, and inside the paper would be the news stories, the recent events, uh, the local news, and things like that, that they would get at the last minute and put in the newspaper uh, at the last minute, then they'd hang that up to dry and then fold it in half like it is here, and that's the paper that would be delivered to the subscribers. The first newspaper to really truly challenge the British authority was the New England Current, which was published by James Franklin starting in 1721 with his 16-year-old brother, a person named Benjamin Franklin, as his apprentice and a co-writer. The Franklin's newspaper became a tool for combating the tight grip of the religious and civil authorities, and James was even thrown into prison. Uh, upon his release, he was actually banned for printing for life. Although young Ben Franklin eventually took over the paper and continued its attacks until he was forced to abandon it. Now, this experience would help light the fire of revolution inside of Ben Franklin, and as you might know, uh, ben Franklin would go on to become one of our founding fathers of the United States, as well as a prominent inventor and statesman. So this growing tension between colonial newspapers and the British authority really came to a head with the trial of John Peter Zenger. Uh, newspaper publishers at this time were really testing the waters in the mid-1700s uh, by publishing critical remarks of the British colonial governors who, in turn, would suppress, fine, or even really shut down uh, colonial newspapers. And if there was ever any colonial governor who drew the public ire, it was Governor William Cosby of New York, who was known for his laziness and debauchery. He ruled basically by impulse and levied excessive taxation on local merchants. So wanting to spark a major confrontation, uh, Zenger published criticism and satirical comments about Cosby who then charged Zenger for criminal libel and threw him into jail. The term libel, by the way, refers to published false statements um, perceived as damaging to a person's reputation. As word of Zenger's coming trial spread, Benjamin Franklin called his personal friend Alexander Hamilton, a liberal Philadelphia lawyer, to come down to, down to New York and defend Zenger. Hamilton delivered a rousing defense of Zenger and convinced the jury to return a not guilty verdict. Zenger was freed, and the case had a major impact on the role of the press in the colonies, as newspapers, newspaper publishers became more bold, and it really helped highlight the importance of protecting the right of newspapers to publish critical commentary of the government. So, with a growing sense of righteousness, colonial newspapers increasingly spread a kind of anti-British sentiment, and the British government helped inflame their passions uh, by passing the Stamp Act of 1765, which for the first time charged a fee through using a stamp on the circulation of newspapers. This decision, truth be told, uh, was a big mistake. I mean, if there was one group of people you really didn't want to upset at this point in time, it was those who owned and published the newspapers that circulated through the colonies, uh, people who had the power of the press. The Stamp Act led to major protest, especially in the city of Boston. Here, you can see an image of angry colonists in Boston reading about this newly declared Stamp Act. 
In response to the new act, on August 14, 1765, a crowd gathered in Boston under a large tree and hung a straw-stuffed effigy of Andrew Oliver, the official who was chosen by King George III to enact the Stamp Act. This protest was actually the first uh, major public show of defiance against the British Crown, and it helped spawn the resistance that would eventually lead to the American Revolutionary War a decade later. Newspapers loudly protested the Stamp Act. Take a look at this image of a colonial newspaper at the time. You can see skulls and crossbones were placed at the corner where the stamp would be placed as a kind of protest with words like, this is the place to affix the stamp. How dramatic. The Stamp Act was part of a broader set of new taxes that were imposed on the colonists by the British, like the Sugar Act or the Tea Act. You've probably heard of that one, right? You know, uh, angry colonists throwing boxes of tea into the Boston Harbor in, pro in protest, as it became known later as the Boston Tea Party. Take a look at this depiction of the Sons of Liberty, a group of subversive revolutionaries. Here, they have tarred and feathered a tax collector, forcing him to drink hot tea. In the background, you can see the Tree of Liberty depicted, with a stamp act declaration turned upside down on the trunk of the tree. 1765, Andrew Oliver has been appointed one of the stamp tax agents in Boston. Rumor spreads through town that in his warehouse on Long Wharf, the stamps have arrived, these hated stamps. The Sons of Liberty descend upon this warehouse and they tear it down with their hands, with crowbars and axes, two-story building they tear down and throw into the harbor to show their disapproval of the stamp tax and anyone who wants to foist them on this community. And then they have a gathering down at the Liberty Tree and they invite Mr. Oliver and he comes and there's an effigy of himself hanging by the neck holding a sign, death to the stamp tax. And they ask him if he would like to resign his commission as stamp tax agent and he says, yes, of course. Sorry, I didn't think of it sooner. These taxes, imposed from across the ocean on the colonists who really had no representation in Britain, helped fuel a growing revolutionary movement uh, with the famous phrase, uh, no taxation without representation. By the 1760s and the 1770s, many colonial newspapers had turned against the British, and some openly called for revolution. The Massachusetts Spy is a great example. Begun by Isaiah Thomas in 1770 and published in Worcester in Boston, the newspaper published anonymously written essays that attacked loyalists and really promoted the patriotic cause. The growing patriotism and revolutionary fervor of the colonial printers culminated in Thomas Paine's 47-page pamphlet, Common Sense, which outwardly called for independence from Britain in really clear and concise language. Published in 1775, the same year that the Revolutionary War broke out, Common Sense became a sensation, and over 120,000 copies were printed and sold. Given that the entire population of the colonies at the time was only two and a half million people, Common Sense is considered to have been the largest sale and circulation of any American book. It's actually kind of amazing when you think about it. Throughout the war, Patriot newspapers continued publishing, Although many were shut down when British occupied different cities, others would have run out of paper and ink uh, when the war would cause shortages. Yet they played a major role in maintaining public support for the revolution. Just to give you a sense of this, uh, here's a passage written in the Massachusetts Spy describing the Battle of Lexington. Americans, forever bear in mind the Battle of Lexington, where British troops unmolested and unprovoked, wantonly and in a most inhuman manner, fired upon and killed a number of our countrymen, then robbed, ransacked, and burned their homes. Nor could the tears of defenseless women, some of whom were in the pains of childbirth, the cries of helpless babes, nor the prayers of old age, confined to beds of sickness, appease their thirst for blood, or divert them from their design of murder and robbery. Certainly, the writing style was pretty dramatic, uh, exaggerated, and often propagandistic, 
really far removed from the model of objective news writing of today's professional journalism. Bias developed over time as the printers increasingly took one side or the other in the arguments over the fights with Great Britain as they get upset over taxes. Uh, the Stamp Act obviously has a big impact because it affects the printers directly because they're the ones who are going to have to put stamps on newspapers in order to uh, obey the law. What ends up happening is really by oh, 1771 or so, it's pretty much one-sided. The Patriot side is being presented, but the Loyalist side is not very common unless you're in a community where the British Army is present. As communities become polarized, if you're going to sell your paper, you've got to come down on the side that most of the people are on, and that increasingly becomes true. Now, one of the things that I think is fascinating about the 18th century is that you also, because of the presence of the Enlightenment, you have this growing sense that if everybody looks at the evidence, they're all going to reach the same conclusion. And, of course, the patriots think they're right, the loyalists think they're right. And so, on one level, you can argue that pay, the printers say, oh, this is a good justification for something that's going to make me money. I can do this because it's the right thing to do. But uh, the reality is that if I'm going to keep selling papers in Boston, you know, prior to the British Army gaining control of the town, then I've got to be, uh, you know, in favor of Sam Adams and his group, or I'm going to be in real trouble. The, their perspective of the role of the press was to create community. And so they were trying to bring everybody together. They didn't want to just, here's all the information you decide for yourself. That's not what they were trying to do. They weren't trying to be objective. They were trying to be subjective and push everybody in a particular direction. And so that fact means that they come down on one side or the other. And that really is going to remain true of American journalism until you get to the 19th century. On September 3rd, 1783, with the signing of the Treaty of Paris, the war came to an end, and the United States took the first steps towards creating an independent nation. This process culminated in the writing and signing of the Constitution of the United States in 1789, which enshrined the principles of a constitutional republic into law, uh, separation of power, the rights of individuals, among many other pr important protections. This new system of secular democratic governance based on inalienable rights was a major historical transformation, which is really part of the legacy of the Age of Enlightenment and the printing press, uh, and also this public sphere that we talked about earlier. The importance and power of newspapers, which were often referred to collectively as the press, was enshrined in these founding documents. The founders wanted to avoid the suppression and censorship imposed by the British in the colonial era. So the First Amendment to the US Constitution explicitly protects the freedom of the press. It reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech of the press or the right of the people to peace, peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So newspapers in early America, as well as in Europe, were by no means objective. They really a far cry from today's professional press. Instead, historians have dubbed newspapers of this time the, the partisan press. The word partisan refers to someone who is aligned with a political party, and the term press refers to newspapers. Newspapers of the time reflected the political, religious, and moral values of the publisher. These early decades of the United States were dominated by two competing political movements and parties. The Federalists, who supported a, a strong central government, and the Anti-Federalists, who favored stronger states' rights. So newspapers were generally either Federalist or Anti-Federalist. For example, here's a commentary written by Benjamin Bach of the Anti-Federalist Philadelphia Aurora, in which Bach attacks then outgoing president George Washington, who was a Federalist. Bach writes, Quote, 
The man who is the source of all of the misfortunes of our country is this day reduced to a level of his fellow citizens and is no longer possessed of power to multiply evils upon the United States. Every heart is in unison with the freedom and happiness of the people, ought to beat high with exaltation the name of Washington, from this day ceased to give a currency. As you can see, the language is overzealous and pretty extreme, calling Washington the source of all of our country's misfortunes and uh, declaring joy that Washington's evil will be gone as he leaves office. To such provocations, opposition newspapers would fire back. William Corbett, editor of the Federalist Porcupine's Gazette, attacked Bach directly in response, writing, he spent several years in hunting offices under the federal government, and being constantly rejected, he at last became its most bitter foe. Hence his abuse of General Washington, whom, at the time he was soliciting a place, he panegyrized to the third heaven. He was born for a hireling, and he sought it in another. He is an ill-looking devil, and his eyes never get above your knees. Corbett is basically calling Bach a loser who is angry over not getting a government job and lobbing insults at him. Insults at the time were rather colorful. The point is, newspapers were highly political, partisan, and were aligned with different political parties and factions at the time. This partisan press would be how American newspapers would function throughout the 1700s and well into the 1800s. Newspapers in Europe and elsewhere were also published in this style, the style of the partisan press. To finish up, I want to take a minute to look at this really interesting animation that shows the growth of newspapers across the US from the 1600s until today. So we can see here in the early 1700s, really the very first newspapers are emerging in the colonies and they're popping up in Philadelphia and Boston and then New York City and eventually in probably Charleston, South Carolina. Not too many. And as we get to the mid and eventually into the late 1700s, we start to see the number of newspapers really basically double. And as we get into the American Revolutionary War period, we see this number continue to increase. And then after the war, we see the number of newspapers really start to expand as the country really starts taking off. The population's growing and it's expanding westward. And as you can see, as we get into the 1800s, as more and more people move into the uh, middle of the country from the coast, from the uh, former colonies, we really see the number of newspapers just exploding. Right now we're up to almost, uh, we're already into 2,000 newspapers here. And so you can, I show this because this gives a really, really useful visualization of how essential and important newspapers were to the development of the country. Basically, wherever people uh, settled and moved in, in the United States, newspapers would spring up. And they really, newspapers really provided for the first really two centuries of our country, newspapers really provided the, the basic backbone of information that people needed and used to um, know things about their daily life, to be informed citizens in a dem democracy, and just they were just essential to civic life in America. And you can see by by the 1900s, you know, we're looking at you know nearly nearly uh, you know 15, 16,000 newspapers across the country. By the mid 1900s, we really see this golden age of newspapers peak. And that's when other mass media uh, would really start to encroach on the turf of newspapers. But newspapers would, would and continue to be extremely important to Americans. Even all the way into the present day, there are still you know, many, many thousands of newspapers that people read uh, about their local communities, about the country at large, about the international world to stay informed.